pray tonight that that you would give us victory over our flesh, that we may surrender to you, and that we may give it all to you, and that we may allow you to have your way in us, to completely have access to every part of us. We pray for blessing. We pray, O Holy Spirit, that you would move in our midst and would minister to our hearts, converse with us, and uh, just deal with each one of us in the way that we need to be uh, spoken to and that you may heal, that you may break, that you may do what needs to be done, that we may look like Jesus Christ. We pray for effectiveness for the word. We pray that this sharp, sharper than two edged, any ed two edged sword, the word that would penetrate into us and reveal things that maybe we're not aware of in our lives. Pray for anointing and um, and just that you would be the one speaking and we would not be listening to lecture or uh, human philosophy or empty deceit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, last week we studied Colossians 2 verses 11 through 13. Tonight we will start with verse 14. So just quickly, you know, because it, it ties into what we're going to talk about. We want to talk about what is it that we're trying to get at here? What are we talking about? So what we're talking about is Christ died. He was crucified on the cross. So, you know, have you ever gone into something or someone wants you to sign up for something and you're like, okay, what's in it for me? Right? You want to know what's in it for you or where else? Because depending on that, you'll either sign up or you just won't sign up at all. Right? And so here... This is, we are going on a series or a pattern of what does Christ's death on the cross accomplish for us to know how, how, how he has set us for success spiritually, how he has set us up with everything perfect. And a lot of times with our own foolishness and our own um, misconceptions, we allow ourselves to fall into these, these lives that are wishy-washy, lives that are unstable, lives that are one day up, the next day down, and he just helps us to walk in victory. So, quick review of what we talked about um, last week, and we'll try not to spend more than five minutes, maybe even less, and then we'll get into what he has done for us for tonight's uh, uh, message for verse 14. So we found that the first thing that he has done is that uh, verse 11, in him you were also circumcised. So past tense. This happened the moment we gave our life to Christ. With the circumcision made without hands, and this is not a, it's not a surgical procedure. This is a spiritual procedure that happens, and it happens of the heart, uh, made without hand by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh. And here the, the part that's been cut off, the circumcision, the, is the body of sins of the flesh. The whole flesh is like, whoosh, cut off. And who did this surgery? Uh, again, verse 11, by the circumcision of Christ. He did it. Without hands, it's supernatural. No credit that you or I can take for our salvation, done by him, without hands. And then, but what did he do? He cut off. Circumcision is cutting off a piece of flesh. So he cut off the flesh, and he called it here, the body of the sins of the flesh. So when you cut off a piece of of flesh from any human, after a while, what happens to it? Like we talked last week, shrivels and dies. Dies. So the first thing Jesus Christ did by his death on the cross for us is he has set us up for big time success. What is it? He cut off the flesh. He killed the flesh. Positionally, all of us, the moment we give our life to Christ, the flesh is dead. I mean, does the flesh give us some trouble as believers or no? Oh, does it give us trouble? It's all our trouble. <laughs> the flesh, three enemies, right? One of them is ours that we were born with is the flesh. Second one, the world. Third one, Satan, the devil. And so here, one of them is ours that we've been born with. We have all this experience with. He says, okay, first enemy, psh, killed it, done. The first setting up of success for us is the flesh is dead. So we need to walk as people with the flesh being dead, not overtaking us, not overpowering us. And um, 
And so, I, you know, I shared with you guys our real story of our dead grass. It went from dead grass, looked hopeless, but watered it long enough, came back to life. What does this mean? This applies to the flesh, meaning the flesh is dead, but I, with my foolishness, can go water it. And guess what? It comes back to life. And, um, you know, just to... I want to pause on this for a second because I want to give a practical what does that mean to water it. Meaning, so say um, someone's issue of the flesh is lusting. So to water that means what? Nurture it. Meaning, whoops, I don't know how that website came in front of me. Really, it typed itself. Come on. I don't know how I ended up at this particular place. I was shocked, you know, in med medical school when I went. And then people laughed at me so much because I didn't know what it, what it was. But I went to this place. It's a Christian gathering. And I said, that's so cool. Look outside. There's a place called Gentleman's Club. And I said, that's like, are these like only where the nice guys go? And they started laughing at me. I didn't know what that meant. And then sadly, I discovered what that meant. But you know, I don't know how I ended up at a gentleman's club, really. You just happened to be there and pay the fee or whatever. That's called watering, nurturing the flesh. So meaning, Christ cut it off. Don't go there. Don't go there. You know, if my issue is, um, I don't know, greed, but then maybe I should stop filling my life with greed or maybe my issue is stuff. I just love the world. I'm worldly, okay? I love things of the world. Stop indulging on the things of the world. Stop subscribing to the magazines of the world and the way people look and what people consider normal, which is anorexia and all this kind of, of obsessions that, that we have. So the first thing for Christ to set us up in success is he killed it. So please don't bring it back to life. The flesh is supposed to be dead. So let us, by as if we go to Galatians 5, which I won't open it up, says, let us, by the Spirit, put to death the flesh. You can't do it on your own. I can't do it. We are such losers. We will lose. That's an unwon battle. Unless we face the flesh by the Holy Spirit, forget it. Flesh has got no chance. So let us, by the Spirit, put to death the works of the flesh. So verse 12 is the second thing that Christ did. I mean, Christ is amazing. If we really just, I, I don't know about you, but I fall in love like, you did all this for me, then why am I in my state? What's wrong with me? It's, yeah, get up, you know, wake up. So the second thing is he did, buried with him in baptism. So not only did he cut off the flesh, he killed the flesh, and he says, and down, boy. He dug a hole put that flesh in there and covered it up. He buried it. Why am I digging back for the flesh? What's wrong with me? He buried the flesh. And so he buried with him in baptism in which you also were raised with him. But then he did something really amazing. So he buried the flesh and then he caused a resurrection. But resurrection without that flesh. Flesh is gone. It's dead. And then caused us to be raised with him through faith in the working of God. Meaning our salvation never happened by our works. It's through faith. Faith what? With what he has done. Through uh, faith of, uh, in the working of God. He did the work. I just trust him. I accept what he has done for me. And so then I accepted the work that he has done for me, who raised him from the dead. So I find myself like, wow. So my flesh is dead? Yeah. Okay. My flesh is buried? Yeah. How about where am I? Raised with him. I don't know, man, but that is sweet. That's really good. Keep going. And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, he says, oh, look at you in the past. You were dead. And also, you had uncircumcision. But guess what? He circumcised you. He circumcised your heart, like we talked in verse 11. He has made alive together with him. Remember, you are no longer dead. You, the flesh is dead. The flesh is buried. But you are alive with him. You're alive and you have your best friend, Jesus, walking on the journey 
with you, but you want to know it's an exciting life. You don't have to go through life like this. But it says here what? Alive with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How many trespasses? All trespasses. So, how many sins that a believer has committed has been forgiven? How many? All. Okay. How many? Let's say, let's not put you in this. Let's put me in this. I'm a believer, and then my life is going to end tomorrow. Okay? And then between now and tomorrow, for my, when my life ends, I'm going to commit five more sins. How many of those are forgiven? Oh. Can you imagine? You know what a sin? It's a debt. Can you imagine? You know, I don't know if you've ever been in debt. It doesn't feel good. You feel changed. You feel in bondage. You got creditors that be like, pay your else and pay with interest. Thank you very much. And there's nothing wrong on their end. It's my fault to get into debt, right? But to pay that last payment, what happens? You feel, oh off my back I'm free I'm financially free I could do whatever I want all my money's mine now I don't have to give any portion to anybody you know what sin is gone it's been forgiven because you know if one of them wasn't you don't go to heaven the wages of sin not sins is death but the gift of God is eternal life so all the sins that have been done all the sins that are being done and all the sins that will be done Forgiven. All of them have been done. So what does this make me feel? I'm alive with him and I got no debt. I mean, it is good. It doesn't get better than that. Life doesn't get better than that with Christ. So what is he saying? He's saying flesh needs to be dead and buried. And I need to be alive, but I don't need to be just alive. I need to be so alive with him because I have this freedom that he has forgiven me. He is not holding a grudge against me. He's not going to bring it up to my face. He's there to walk alongside. He's there to lead me through my journey of life as I fulfill his will. So that's what we talked about. But that's not all Christ has done. He's amazing. Look at what he's done in verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. So he wiped it out. What does that mean, wiped it out? Gone. What did he wipe out? Oh, he wiped out something called the handwriting of requirements. And what did those handwriting of requirements do? It was against us. So is that thing to our favor or not to our favor? Not to our favor. Okay? So um, in another translation, it says, the certificate of debt. He took a certificate of debt. That's against you, right? Anyone that has a certificate of debt is what? It's not a pro thing. It's a negative thing. It's against you. He took it, and he says, oh. Wiped it out. He wiped it out. Wow. Does anyone know what is that? Requirements that's against us? That certificate of debt? What is that? It's the law. Did you know that the law was never there to be on our side? It was there to what? It was a tutor in Galatians, it says. It was a tutor to Christ. It says, you failure. Yep, failed again. Whoops, you messed up on that one. Oh, adultery. 100% of the people in the room committed it. Murder, 100% committed it. Whoever's angry with his brother for no reason, oh, come on, we've all done it. Guilty, 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 and all it did is, well, I am, well, I am. Yeah, buddy, you're going down. You are going down. That's what it says. So he, Jesus, took that thing that was against us, and he said, I'm going to wipe it away. Having wiped, he's already done it in the past. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was 
against us. So first it says it's against us. Second it says, which was contrary to us. It was never for our own good. He wiped it away. And he has taken it out of the way. So here he wiped it. And he says, okay, now let me remove it. Taking it out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross. And then he took it to the cross. Hammered it there. The cross. So many things happen in the cross. Guess what went to the cross? Sin went to the cross. Guess what went to the cross? Romans 6. Our flesh was nailed to that cross. Guess what went to the cross? The law, which was against us. He took it and he put it on that cross. It's amazing. He took that which was, you know, holding us, um, you know, that which had dirt on us. You know, imagine, you know, you, you, you go somewhere and someone has dirt on you. You're like, please don't talk. Please don't tell. Please have mercy. I'll give you whatever. You want some chocolate? <laughs> you know, what do you want? I'll give you anything. Just please don't expose me. Right? If someone's got dirt on you, they've what? They got the upper hand. They're like, uh, they give you a little look. And then you're like, okay, I'll behave. I'll do whatever you want me to say. That's what the law did. The law said, uh, guilty, 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 my friend. You're going to hell, buddy. You are guilty. But Jesus went and he wiped it away. How did he do that? He took it to the cross. The thing is, God is just. Yes, God is loving. Yes, God is merciful. But God is also just. And so his justice says that 100% of us go where? To hell. Because if we committed one sin equals hell. But his love and his mercy says what he wants. His desire is 100% of us go where? To heaven. The issue is, reality says we're going to hell. His love says, his ideal is he wants us in heaven. Is hell real or not? It's real. Who was hell made for? Yes, Satan and his angels or his demons. Never made for a human being. Jesus Christ himself is the one that said that. So how does he do this? Well, there's a problem. There's handwritten requirements that show that we're guilty. So he says, well, the price has to be paid. So he says, I will be that price. So he went and he took that, he paid that price with his own, by living, he fulfilled the written requirements, perfect in all. That's why he says Jesus Christ said something so bold that not one human being could ever say. He said, I stand and he says, the, 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 the ruler of the air, Satan, comes at me and he has a beef with me. He's trying, he's been trying for 33 years 33, a little bit over 33 years. He's been trying to find one thing on me. He's been trying to find one dirt on me, and he couldn't. And he says, and he found nothing. Only he was able to do it. Why did he have to make that statement? Because he had to say that he's the only one that fulfilled the law. And then he took the payment. He paid the price for it, and that's why he has made it possible where he meets God's justice, can meet with God's love and God's mercy in Jesus Christ. And that's how heaven is possible for us. So he said, I took that and I nailed it to the cross. You know, in Romans chapter 7. Romans 7 verse 6. Uh, written there, it says, but now we have been delivered from the law. Delivered, you're free. Delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. So the law is against us. So guess what? We died with Christ. And then we resurrected. We're dead. Sorry, law. You have nothing on me. I am dead to um, what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I'm no longer living by, by just, oh, the letter, the letter, the letter. I'm not living by legalism. 
But I'm living new, I'm fresh, I'm alive in Him, forgiven by Him, like we read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And I, am, I have newness of the Spirit. Now I no longer walk by myself, but the Holy Spirit leads me and helps me and guides me and gives me victory in my life. In Romans 6, just the, the chapter before, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. So yes, I've been delivered from the law. Now I live in newness of the Spirit. Now sin is no longer, doesn't have a grip on me. Over me, no dominion, doesn't have authority. Why? For you are not under law, but under grace. I've been delivered from the law and I'm not under the law. So, guess what? If I'm not under the law, sin has no dominion, doesn't have authority over me. I'm under grace. And this is great. No requirements against me, my sins are forgiven best things to be Christian. I could do whatever I want. I mean, it's all forgiven. What I'm going to sin tomorrow if I'm a believer is forgiven. So just do whatever you feel like. Well, Romans 8, verse 4. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He says, no, not at all. If you think like that, I promise you, me, I have doubt you're a believer. What he's saying here is, yes, chapter 6 says, I am not under the dominion. There's no dominion of sin against me because I'm not under law, I'm under grace. Great. Because it's been nailed on that cross. Chapter 7 says that I am not, I have been delivered from the law. Great. So do I live the law or not? Chapter 8 says, yes, you do. How? It says, for what the law could, uh, uh, sorry, verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled who, in who? In, in us, believers. We're supposed to be living the law. I thought we've been delivered from the law. Yes, the letter we've been delivered from. But here we live, the righteous requirement become fulfilled in us. It just becomes automatic part of our life. Who do not walk according to the flesh. Remember, flesh is dead. We can't walk by the flesh. We lose if we walk by the flesh. But according to the spirit. Then it becomes a whole different story. Where I am no longer trying to live the law because I'm afraid of God. Because it says you do it, you will live. And if you are guilty of one, you're guilty of all. You die. Now I find myself, look how he loved me. He died on the cross for me. He paid the price for me. He set me free. He gave me newness of life. He resurrected me. He raised me. Oh, wait a minute. He took me all the way. Ephesians, right? He took me and he seated me in the heavenlies. I find myself, I want to live for you. I can't just see this amazing love and just continue in my way. But I do realize I have a problem. I'm weak. And I find myself saying, I can do this according to the Spirit. I need to be empowered by your Holy Spirit to be able to live that life that fulfills the law, not in some person that I look up to, but in me, through the Holy Spirit. You know, isn't that what Philippians Chapter 2, verse 13 says, Philippians 2.13, it says, For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You want to do good? Do you want to live that law? Stop trying to do it on your own. Stop. We're terrible at it. We don't know how to do it. Just tell him, God, I need help with two things. I need help with willing. Even a lot of times, I don't even have the umph to even desire it. I want help with that. Because sometimes I find myself, all my desires are no good. But then after you put that desire in me, can you just go to the extra step with me, Lord, and do? It is God who works in you both to will and to do 
f not for my good pleasure, but for his good pleasure. We can fulfill the law completely through the work that he has done for us. So back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. We've seen that Jesus Christ did something amazing, having wiped out uh, the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Guys, the law, no more authority over us. No more authority of us. It can't, you know, we can go like that to it. It's just like, whatever, man, you can't. But I'm going to live for him by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to allow God to have his place in me so that I can will and do according to his good pleasure. I'm going to live through the power of the Holy Spirit that I may satisfy him and live that law, but not afraid of it, not because I'm afraid of him or afraid of it or afraid of what will happen to me, but because I love him. And I'm so in love with God and what he has done for me. And that's why I'm going to live that life for him. Verse 15, the last thing that he has done for us, it's really amazing uh, in this chapter. It says that having disarmed principalities and powers. Whoa. Do you guys know what principalities and powers are? Demons. These are like the, the, the big authoritative powers out there. The things stronger than anything out there. Is principalities and powers. You know what he did to it? He disarmed it. You know what disarmed means? So let's say, let's let's just to make a visual here. So I have a machine gun. Disarm me, you took it away. Okay? Now imagine. Imagine if someone comes up to you, okay? Hopefully no one has ever experienced something like that. But imagine someone comes up to you with a gun. Puts it to your head. It says, give me your money right now. What would you do? That's pretty scary. I mean, you give him the money. That's the easy thing. But a lot of times you won't even remember where the money was. But like, You guys remember Nazi's story on Sunday when he <laughs> was sharing? He says, you know, he was a pr doctor in prison. And they put him with another prisoner who uh, this is like the, the, the heavy-duty criminals. And all they give him is a whistle, and they have all these doors. He says it takes half an hour to open. He says, they, say, they told him, you know, if someone does something bad, just whistle, and we'll come in. And he's like, first of all, I, I won't even have the power to whistle. I'm going to be so scared to whistle. For Same thing, you know, if someone puts a gun to your head and says, you know, give me your money or I'm going to shoot you, well, you'll be scared. You're going to want to give him the money. Now, let's say, okay, let's say it's like some scrawny little guy. But they have a gun and they put it to your head. Are you scared or not anymore? I'm still scared. They got a gun, man. You play dead? Yeah, but you're alive already. You couldn't do it beforehand. You know, it's too, that doesn't work. That only works for those. What's that animal that does that? What's it called? What? A possum. Yeah, 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 that thing. Yeah, you know. So that's not going to work. Now let's say. You know for sure that, yes, that's a real gun, but you know absolutely sure that there is zero bullets in that gun. And that same scrawny little guy comes up to you and puts that gun to your head. And you know for sure, without a doubt, that there's no bullet. And he says, give me your money. What are you going to do? Beat him up, you yeah. Put him, or if you're a Christian, be like, get out of my way, you know, like, go play with someone else. Come on, little kid. Satan and his demons are a big deal, principalities and powers. But because of the work of Jesus Christ, they're disarmed. They can bark, but they can't bite. You know, I love Peter, 1 Peter 5, it says, Satan is what? Hmm? Say it out loud. Thank you. Not a roaring lion, like a roaring lion. What's the difference? He's like one. He can't swallow you. He says, seeking whom he may devour. He can make big noises. He can make loud noises. He could be scary. But he's disarmed. He's like a snake, but the poison has been taken out. He can't do nothing to you. Satan, based on this verse and the working of Jesus Christ, 
can't hurt us, can't hurt a believer unless that believer wants to be hurt. Unless they put themselves in Satan's mouth. He's disarmed. He's got blanks. He's got fake weapons. He's got nothing. Having disarmed principalities and powers. And I think if we really realize this, I don't think we'll be afraid of Satan anymore. I don't think he's, that's it. He's done. But Christ did not stop there. Did not just disarm Satan. And that would be amazing. But he disarmed principalities and powers. That's the first thing. This is talking about victory in Christ. The second thing is he did. He made a public spectacle of them. What's them? Satan and all his crew. What's a public spectacle? Meaning, huh? Making fun, yes, that would, that's one. But also, public spectacle, is this something that is widely known or is this something that's secret? Everyone knows. This, this is the type of thing is on Facebook, is on Pinterest, is on, let me think of all this. <laughs> so, what did you say? Twitter, oh, Twitter, of course. How can I forget Twitter? Everything goes on Twitter right away. It's on Twitter. This, hit Twitter first, okay, before Facebook, all right? From my knowledge of the social media, and I'm on none of it, okay? Don't try to find me. And if you find my name, it's someone who's, a, who's trying to <laughs> imposter. And then, um, what else? Uh, you know, it's on the internet. It's everywhere. It just, it's, it's in the newspaper. If you ever buy one, what? Who buys a newspaper nowadays, right? You do? Oh, good. You know, you throw it out of the door once a week. But um, so it's made known. So here he says, you are disarmed, Satan. But also, I've exposed you to believers. You got no new tricks. And every single trick you've got has been exposed and revealed in the Bible. That's why I love 2 Corinthians. Paul says, for we are not ignorant of his thoughts about Satan. We know how you think. We know how you do it. We know how you play the game. And it's why it's all over the web, man. To Satan. If we really understand what Christ has done for us in this part of Colossians, we would fall in love with Christ and look at ourselves and say, why are we so sad? Why are we so lame in our walk? Because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't add up. Because I'm getting tricked by someone who's been exposed in his ways that are known and who's got no power, is disarmed, yet I fall for his traps. Really? It doesn't make any sense. You know, if we saw someone that fell for that, we'd say, whoa, you're so dumb. Well, I want to tell you, we're all so dumb. But the third thing, he didn't stop there. Triumphing over them, in it. Oh, Christ triumphed in it. You know, triumph is a big word that in order to understand it, we have to go back 2,000 years in history to go back to the Roman Empire. So the way a triumph is called is when a Roman uh, leader goes and, and conquers in order to be able to get something called a triumph, a Roman triumph, they have to go conquer extra land, but not just conquer extra land. They have to kill at least 5,000 soldiers, so 4,999, not good enough. 5,000 soldiers minimum and have extra land that they've won for the Roman Empire. Then they come back and they, have, they get something that's very special called a Roman triumph. Roman triumph, the leader walks in it or usually rides on a horse. And as the leader rides on a horse, those who are with him, you know, the people that helped him, they walk behind him. And then he goes, he's usually on a golden chariot, and he's going to the, to the place of the Olympics over there, the big stadium. And as he's doing this, there are priests coming, and they bring this, this, this fragrance, an aroma, and then everyone smells that aroma. And when you smell that aroma, you're like, triumph, there's victory here. And that is special. So here Jesus Christ, he did something called what? 
that triumphing over them in it. He had triumph. He had complete victory. That means he had at least new land. And he killed at least 5,000 soldiers. Has Jesus done that or no? Oh, has he done that? First of all, he wiped out Satan. And he defeated Satan. But you guys remember on the day of Pentecost, how many people came to know Jesus Christ? No, 3,000. And then you flip one page or two pages in the book of Acts. And in just a few days, it went from 3,000 to 5,000. There's the 5,000. He has conquered hearts without a sword. He has conquered hearts by his love. And he's walking in triumph. He, we are following a Lord who has complete victory. And there's this aroma that's coming out. You know, in um, Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 8, it says, Therefore he says, when he, about Jesus, ascended on high, he's going up, with this after the work of the cross, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He, he defeated Satan. He took captivity and then he gave gifts to men. And then he started giving us, giving us gifts. Now, open up 2 Corinthians. I'll end with this verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse uh, 14. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. Now, thanks be to God. Here, Paul it's like, oh, I'm so excited. Thanks be to God. Why? Who always leads us in what? Triumph. What is a triumph? We just, we just described it. I'm not going to say it again. So, now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in who? In Christ. Who did the triumph? Him, not us. Who always leads us in triumph. So, are we trying to get triumph or are we walking in triumph? We're walking in triumph because the battle has been won already. We're just walking. We are the soldiers behind our great leader who has won the battle. And we are walking in triumph. He always wants to lead us in there. He says, hey, believer, believer, why are you down? Believer, why are you lukewarm? Believer, why do you slide back? Believer, why are you in sin? Believer, get behind me. Join the parade of my victory. Join the, par the parade of, of my triumph and live in triumph. Because the battle has been won. Don't live defeated. Live victorious. And this is, should happen how often for a believer? It says always. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. He never leads us to defeat. We are, get defeated only because we are the ones that allow ourselves to be defeated to, to, through Christ. And through us, whoa, there's a role for us? Yes. Through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Meaning, believers, walk with your head up high. Not arrogance, but with your head up high, meaning you're living in victory. You're following. You're, you are proud of your leader. It says that, uh, um, I believe, uh, Galatians 6, it says, uh, verse 14, But God forbid that I should boast except. Do we, do we boast or not? Yes, we do. In what? Except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world was crucified, has been crucified to me and I to the world. I boast in him. I boast in what he has done. And by the way, he leads me in triumph, so I'm going to walk with my head up high. Walk because he's victorious. And because he's victorious, I live in that victory. And not only do I live in that victory always, but also there's a diffusion. There's this aroma. Remember the priests? And guess what we are in Revelation chapter 1? That he has made us kings and priests to his father. So there's this aroma coming out. There's diffusion. What is it called? The fragrance. What's the smell coming out of us? You know? I don't know what you wear. Chanel 5? Huh? Or <laughs> well, here's what I and you should be wearing. It's called his knowledge in every place. Whew. <laughs> you smell it? 
it's good, good stuff, the best aroma. What are you wearing? Knowledge. In every, his knowledge. His knowledge. Where is this? In every place. Whoa, brother. That smells good. What is that? His knowledge. You should try it. Sister, you smell like the brother, but it smells good. What do you got on? His knowledge. In every place. I don't know if this puts you to shame or not, but it does put me to shame. Because is it really every place that I'm at that my actions, people see Jesus Christ and know him more? Or do I sometimes push people away from Christ? Or do I sometimes just, I wish that they just don't know that I'm Christian because I'm ashamed of what I just did. And here Jesus says, guys, he has triumphed. He always leads us in triumph. So put on that perfume. Be that fragrance. Not in some places. Not when you feel like it. Not when it's appropriate. But his knowledge in every place. Just to read our verses that we studied. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I pray that legalism is out of our life, but now we live by the Spirit, and we fulfill the law in us, not through our power anymore, but through his power. Verse 15, having disarmed principalities and powers. May the Lord help us to not fear Satan, not be afraid of Satan. Can he read my thoughts? Can he do? Forget it. He's disarmed. Just don't give him your ear. That's what made Eve fall. Eve didn't fall after the conversation. Eve fell because she gave him an ear. He's disarmed. The second is, he made a public spectacle of them. All of Satan's thoughts, all of his tactics, all of his ideas have been revealed in the Bible. The problem is we don't know the Bible. Or we know, but we know partially. We don't know enough. That's why when he came at Jesus, and he didn't like that Jesus kept telling him, it is written, it is written, because Jesus only speaks the Bible. Then Satan says, well, it is written. And Jesus says, yes, but it's also written. Meaning, I know what's written, but you didn't look at the context of what it says. And that's why he says, don't test the Lord your God. In that section, it says, if it happens that this is where you end up, then the Lord will take care of you. He will get his angels to catch you. But he doesn't say to walk in there by yourself. Read the context. I know your ways, and the way I discover it is through the word of God. How is our intimacy with his word and knowing his word protects us a lot? The third thing is Jesus is victorious, and that victory is ours. We need to walk in it, but there needs to be People need to know Jesus. You know, he's got ambassadors. Corinthians, right? Second Corinthians 5. Those are ambassadors are us. We need to represent heaven. We need to know that we are an ambassador, lives in a foreign country, but they live as if they are from their original country, in the foreign country. It's exactly us. We should be living as people from heaven on earth, but we are not from earth. We are representatives of our country, of our home, of our heaven of our Jesus. We need to have the knowledge, his knowledge, to be in every place that we go. People need to know that we live, a vic but that requires us to walk in triumph, to walk in a victorious life. And then guess what? His name won't be shamed, but then there will be fruit. And there will be, there will be a lot of things. You know, in Second Corinthians, that part, the next couple of verses, explains that even more to the end of that chapter, what that fragrance is, what does that fragrance to people who will believe, what does that fragrance to people who won't believe, what does that fragrance to people who are believers, it's amazing what that fragrance is. But we need to be that fragrance. That's why he left us here. If you and I are alive, he has a purpose for us. And one of that purposes, many purposes, but one of them is to be a fragrance, to diffuse the knowledge of him to others. Let's spend a couple of minutes in prayer. 
If anyone wants to, uh, to pray out loud. <laughs> 